Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. It's been a long anticipated event. The Pope will be in Canada by Monday next week. And as organizers scramble to make last minute preparations, a Winnipeg residential school survivor says she and others are feeling left behind. Sav Jonesa brings us this story. Nine year residential school survivor, Cherry Shingus, didn't expect to be this stressed out. It's like when we were in residential school, again. <laughs> she has spent the past few weeks searching for resources on how to attend the Pope's upcoming visit, but the answers are not easy to find. The survivors have to, they need to make the phone calls on their own. Instead of preparing herself mentally for the difficult trip, she's had to deal with logistics instead. So in my planning, I want, I want to be protected too as well because we're standing in front front of a, a evil source that brought harm to us residential school survivors. The Pope's upcoming visit was named Walking Together, signaling the church's commitment to put residential school survivors first. But survivors like Shingus feel like they're walking alone. It's very oppressive. It's very challenging. The Government of Canada announced $30 million to fund travel fees for survivors, but that money is proving hard to find. The survivors have to um, search on their own, like, you know, Google search, and and then they, they need to make the phone calls on their own. Our own research turned up zero results for how to claim the funding, so we turned to the media relations person for a list of who received it. This was a dead end as well, as we were directed multiple times to the same Government of Canada webpage with vague information on what the funds are for, but yet again, not who to contact. For Jerry Shingoose, this is proof that survivors are not the focus for this historical visit. And they should have made a link available where uh, survivors could register and um, they could have accommodations made for them and like you know just make it easy for us. Many may wonder why survivors would go to such great lengths to see the Pope but for Jerry she isn't just going for herself. I'm going to stand there for my brother George who never got to tell his story and I'm going to stand there for my parents because my parents, their children were taken. I'm going to stand there for the survivors that, that can't make it. I'm going to stand there strong and proud. For those still living after the atrocities took place in the residential school system, there is pride in showing that they are still here and that they are not alone. I just want to stand there as a Anishinaabe Kwe, like, you know, proud and let them know that we survived and, like, you know, I, I'm, my hair is long, <laughs> like, you know, I, I don't, nobody could cut it for me anymore. And though the papal visit is only one week long, Jerry Shingus hopes the Pope will see the extent of the lasting effects and sincerely acknowledge the pain left. Yeah, I carry it every day. I carry that experience every day. And then he needs to, he needs to see that. And, and we can't we can't move forward with healing or reconciliation until they acknowledge that truth of what happened to those little children. We reached out to Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs for an interview. They emailed us back again without few specifics. The National Indian Residential School Crisis Line is available for survivors and others who might need support. Now that number is 1-866-925-4419.
Meanwhile, some indigenous groups are pleading for the return of artifacts ahead of the Pope's historic visit to Canada. The Vatican says the items including feathered headdresses, carved walrus tusks, masks, and embroidered animal skins were gifts. But indigenous groups who were shown some of the collection last spring are questioning how some of the works were actually acquired. The president of the Métis National Council says returning the items would help heal the intergenerational trauma and enable indigenous peoples to tell their own story. Well, the papal tour is now just days away and like all papal visits, millions of Catholics around the world will be watching. The crowds in Canada are expected to be huge. Among them, a handful of residential school survivors who are the reason His Holiness is here in the first place. For more, we're joined by Negan Sinclair with the Winnipeg Free Press and Kerry Benjo of Eagle Feather News. Kerry Negan, thanks for being with us again. Uh, millions of Catholics worldwide will be learning about how Indigenous people were treated by the church and the state. Now, the Pope and the Prime Minister are preaching penitence and forgiveness. What do you think, uh, Negan, we'll start with you, what do you think the rest of the world is going to think or do because of this trip? Well, I think the exact fact of what you said, millions will be watching, is exactly why it's taken so long. I mean, this should have been done back in 2016 when it was called for by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, but what will be exposed as well is the fact that the Catholic Church still has not paid their mandated compensation, legally mandated compensation. And there's also documents that they are holding in the Vatican and in archives throughout Canada that still have yet to make it to the hands of survivors. And so this will be exposed as well this week. Kerry, do you think the, the rest of the world's gonna be paying attention to this trip? Yeah, definitely. Um, like Nigan said, it was a lot of public pressure worldwide that contributed to, to this trip and why um, it's, it's finally happening. Kerry, if the Pope begs for forgiveness, uh, what happens after that in the context of not just Canada, but the Christian world? Uh, from your personal perspective, uh, what should happen? Well, I'm speaking as a former residential school student and four generations of my family attended residential school. And so for me, this visit and this um, whole event has taken on a, a much personal um, role within my life and within my family. And an apology is fine. It's good. It's a good start. But I want to see concrete change. Things that residential schools contributed to, um, like the living conditions on reserve. Why do we have to live in, in third world conditions when the rest of the Canada doesn't? I want to see something happening that actually changes the lives of Indigenous people, especially those living on reserve. Nigan, aside from an apology, uh, what more would you like to see? Well, I think exactly you just saw it, uh, a survivor like Carrie and thousands of others who have been calling for changes in their relationship with the Catholic Church. I mean, frankly, the Catholic Church still has a massive footprint in our communities. And what that means is, is that not only do Indigenous peoples uh, continue to be impacted by some of the atrocities the church has still continue to do, but that also uh, many Indigenous peoples want a positive relationship with the church. I mean, it is a very big, significant part of our lives, my family's lives. And uh, for many Indigenous peoples, hopefully this will get some kind of uh, some kind of peace, uh, which is exactly why it had to take place on Canadian soil. The TRC was very specific to say that the apology cannot just take place in the Vatican, although that was a very remarkable moment to see ceremonies on the very place that was banned us in the past and called us superstitious devil worshippers. But to have it in Canada, to have the Pope face off against survivors and to say sorry, that will be a significant moment, but will only be the beginning of what must be a change in a relationship and a change of ethics and respect by the church in our communities. Carrie, we've heard a lot of um, you know issues with survivors trying to access the thirty million dollars that the the federal government has provided here. Uh, do you think this could have all been handled a lot smoother? <laughs> Definitely, it could have. This shouldn't have ha 
taken so long. It should have been a much smoother transition. Um, things were proven in court. This happened, and yet there was still a lot of fight. There's still a lot of fight going on. Um, I know there's a lot of survivors that want our our artifacts return to us. There's a number of um, things that were taken from residential school students that are are still in museums and still still in archives. And there's a lot of people that that want those back. Nigan, do you think this all could have been handled uh, better logistically? Uh, you know, we're, we're hearing, like I said, of survivors having trouble finding rooms, uh, how they're going to get there, uh, despite the government uh, setting aside millions for those types of things. Well, I mean, you only have to look logistically at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as an example of how survivors should be treated. Uh, it wasn't perfect at the beginning, uh, but they certainly learned along the way. And by the end, the national events went very smoothly involving the bringing of survivors and support of survivors. And, you know, we just came forth from a pandemic in which money was made available, billions of dollars were made available to Canadians virtually overnight, uh, put into their accounts in weeks. I mean, this could have been handled a hundred times better. And the fact is that, you know, there may have not been the priority placed on this that uh, the government would have placed if it had been non-Indigenous people. Carrie, do you think that, uh, or are you hopeful that there'll be some, some healing achieved here for survivors? I think it's a good start. We've seen a lot of progress with other churches like the Anglican Church, who's working alongside survivors. And it would be really, nice to see the Catholic Church taking the same initiative and and being more forthcoming, be more welcoming and be willing to accept their responsibility in, in the damage they've, they've done to Indigenous people. Uh, Nigon, finally here, there, there are calls to repeal the doctrine of discovery as well. Uh, what effect could that have? On the ships of explorers, when they arrived in the 15th century, uh, we're talking people like Columbus, Jacques Cartier, and so on, uh, they carried with them papal bulls. Uh, these were decrees from the Pope. And what was on those pieces of paper was that uh, upon arriving onto so-called empty land, and in the case of Europeans, it was land, even if it had human beings but were considered non-Christians, then basically the land could just be inhabited and declared for the king. That's what the Doctrine of Discovery looks like. And the basis for Canada is on top of that. It's like a house, right? So it's like the foundation of a house. Uh, so the foundation of it is that Indigenous peoples don't matter and the Indigenous peoples don't exist and, and we don't have things like government when, of course, obviously we do. So the problem is, is that when you call for the end of the Doctrine of Discovery, it really will involve building a whole new house. And I'm not sure Canada's ready for that. I think Canadian law is under a precedent system, meaning it's built on decisions that are, and the first decision of all is that Indigenous peoples don't matter. I would like to see it. However, there's a lot of work to take place before that will happen. Kerry, uh, Nigan, we'll have to leave it there, but uh, I appreciate you both taking some time. We'll see what happens next week. You got you. Thank you. Also coming up next week on APTN National News, Kathleen Martins and Brittany Gio bring you an interview with fugitive priest Johannes Rivoire from the city of Lyon in France. I'm Kathleen Martins in Lyon, France, to bring you an interview with Johannes Rivoire. He's the retired Catholic priest accused of sexually abusing some Inuit children in Nunavut. He says he didn't do it. That's to come on APTN National News.
Look back. The brother of a man assaulted in Battleford, Saskatchewan, says his family is still reeling after Colby Tatusis was attacked, after three men accused him of stealing while returning a rented trailer. Mylan Tatusis joins me now. Mylan, thanks for being with us. Uh, can you tell us what happened to Colby? Yeah, well, on Sunday evening, my brother was turning a, a returning a trailer that uh, we borrowed off family friends there, Eleanor Sunchild in Battleford. And while unhooking the trailer, three individuals uh, walked up to him and, and ultimately, you know, one individual did attack him. There was surveillance video of what happened. Can you kind of describe to us what it shows and where it was from? <laughs> Correct. Well, the, the video, I mean, the, I believe the one that was released was um, a recorded uh, version of the video through a cell phone. The RCMP do have a 4K video that is um, pretty high resolution. And that high resolution video does show um, my brother pulling into the yard. Um, it does show him um, unhooking that trailer and these three individuals trespass onto the yard and one individual stand on the truck, uh, between the truck and the trailer and, and launch a sucker punch, a jumping sucker punch to my brother's face, ultimately getting him on the ground and then um, grabbing his braid and delivering another blow to the head. How's your family feeling about the RCMP response? You know, the RCMP response has been pretty slow. Uh, I know people in the Balfords region and all across Canada, Indigenous people have um, not the best relationship with the RCMP. You know, we do know that our people are arrested fairly quickly uh, without 4K footage. So the big questions we have is, you know, despite there being 4K footage, despite, you know, the settler community in Balford naming these individuals and reporting these individuals and knowing who they are based off the photos that were released by the family um it took a, quite a while to arrest one individual and there's still two individuals that are um still out there that they're they're they're, they're trying to charge um and the reality is one of those does sound like a weapons charge and um we're still not seeing that arrest take place and why is it that this uh individual with the weapons charge can choose to conveniently uh, turn themselves into police when a lot of our people aren't offered that that privilege. Now that one person has been charged with assault, uh, how is your family feeling about that? You know, it's, it's a very weak charge. You know, every time our people, uh, you know, are arrested or something happens, we always hear these settlers say, throw the book at them. We always hear them say, you know, you live with your consequences, you deal with what you've uh, done. Um, the big question I have is that book reserved only for Indians because the reality is is that that's 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 a small charge and and despite there being 4k footage of this incident it's it's frustrating it's annoying ultimately it's it's not a surprise like I really felt that you know we're entering a new chapter in the Balfords area socially with all these settlers coming forward and choosing to stand against this injustice but the policing system and you know ultimately the justice system looks like it's playing out the way it always has for us and and that system hasn't been designed for us and ultimately it looks like it's protecting white Canadians. Mylon we'll uh, have to leave it there but do appreciate you taking some time to speak with us. No problem thank you. We reached out to Saskatchewan RCMP for comment, but they asked for more information on the family's concerns and have yet to respond. To the sports world now, the Canadian Football League is broadcasting its first ever game in Cree on Windspeaker Radio in Alberta. This Friday's game between the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and Edmonton Elks will be heard throughout the province of Alberta. The game will also have the national anthem performed in both English and in Cree. Halftime will also feature Indigenous performers. Windspeaker Radio announcer Wayne Jackson hopes this game is just the first of many to be broadcast in Indigenous languages. I would love to see more games, especially with uh, Calgary. So that would be a real rivalry. But any other, any other game would be awesome. Um, I think also in revitalization of our revitalization of our languages it'd be also nice if it was done in the other languages cree is the predominant language in canada because of our number because of our our uh, population but i think other languages need to also be encouraged such as black with satina dene uh, and dakota and all the sorts in alberta so yeah this is just a start and i'm hoping to see more of this not a big cfl fan but i will tune in for that game Time for another quick break. Coming up, the Native American Journalists Association has announced its awards for 2022. Details coming up.
Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. And we're headed back to Burretton Lake in southeastern Manitoba for uh, another photo from Dana Kelly. Enjoying the setting sun. Great area, she says, although lots of mosquitoes this year. You can send your photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at Friday's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, 30 with showers in Halifax, 31 and rain in Fredericton. 19 with rain in Kujuac, rain in Nain and a high of 8. 30 for Montreal, 25 with showers in Val d'Or. Sunny and 26 for Sault Ste. Marie, showers and 26 in North Bay. 29 with rain in Thunder Bay, 22 with showers in Sioux Lookout. Rain and 20 for God's Lake and Norway House. 28 in Winnipeg, showers and 28 in Dauphin. Showers and 28 in Regina, 27 with rain in Saskatoon. Rain and 24 in Meadow Lake, showers and 18 in La Ronge. In Northern Alberta, 24 in Peace River, 23 for Grand Prairie. 26 in Lethbridge, 24 in Edmonton. Showers and 22 in Vancouver, sun's out and 22 in Victoria. Sunny and 25 for Prince George and Smithers. 19 with showers in Old Crow, 16 in rain in Whitehorse. Sunny and 20 in Yellowknife, 27 in Norman Wells. 15 in Cloudy and Saks Harbor, showers and 21 for Pulatuck. 17 in Chesterfield and Whale Cove. Plus three in Resolute, eight in Arctic Bay. Some good news for us here as APTN News won six awards at this year's Native American Journalist Association's 2022 National Native Media Awards. APTN National News was named the best newscast. In the TV news category, Angel Moore won first place for her story on Mi'kmaq fishers vowing to continue fishing despite harassment from Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Priscilla Wolf won third place for her story on Muscogan First Nation, starting its search for unmarked graves at the former residential school. Cullen Crozier and Kenneth Jackson were awarded first place in the multimedia category the for their episode of Investigates in Plain Sight about the sex trade in Kenora, Ontario. Brett Forrester won second place for best feature story in the print and online category for his story, Death by a Thousand Cuts, about the struggle to get racism under control at Indigenous services and Crown Indigenous relations. And our Executive Director of News and Current Affairs and Executive Management, Cheryl McKenzie, is being recognized with the Milestone Achievement Award for her 21 plus years of excellence in the field of journalism. Our own Daryl Stranger will be co-hosting the awards gala with ICT's Aaliyah Chavez in Phoenix, Arizona in late August. A huge congrats to all of the winners and to Cheryl on such a high honor. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. For much more, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca, and stick around and encore our episode of Nation to Nation with Brett Forrester is up next. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night.